Welcome back, and um, I'm simply going to be the timekeeper for this panel on ethics and free will. And we're going to take this, we're going to cluster the speakers. We'll start with the three philosophers on responsibility, and then the two economists. So first, uh, Tim. Uh, thank Tim you, Scanlon, thank Harvard you, University. There are at least three kinds of responsibility that may be threatened by the possibility that all our actions and attitudes are caused by factors outside of us over which we have no control. The first of these threats is to what I'll call personal responsibility. The possibility that our actions and attitudes are caused by factors outside us may seem to threaten the significance that they have for us. These attitudes and actions may cease to be ours in, in a way that renders them meaningless. We feel that we are mere puppets or prisoners of our circumstances. Second, there's the possibility that all our actions and attitudes are caused, second, that there is the possibility that all our attitudes and attitudes are caused by factors outside us may seem to mean that we're not responsible for them in the way required in order for these actions and attitudes to be the basis for moral blame or moral credit. It may seem inappropriate to blame us for these things because they were not up to us. Third, if our actions are caused by factors outside of us over which we have no control, then we may not be responsible for what we do in the way required for these actions to affect our moral obligations to others and their obligations to us. Our promises may not be binding because they were not entered into freely. Our decisions to forego certain benefits or take certain risks may not reduce the obligations of others to help us because these decisions, again, were not voluntary. Each of the last two threats might be called a threat to moral responsibility, but to separate them, I will reserve this term for the former, the one concerned with blame. I'll call the latter a threat to substantive responsibility since it involves the content of our obligations. In each case, whether the fact that our actions are caused by factors outside of us uh, may, uh, may render those actions uh, meaningless in one of the three ways depends upon what that kind of meaning is. It depends upon what we need in order to think of our lives as important from our own point of view. It depends upon what blame amounts to and why, why, uh, wh what we can do in order to deserve it. Uh, and third, depends upon how we understand the process through which obligations uh, are, are generated. Uh, Coming, coming to terms with this is an interpretive task, as we learn from justice for hedgehogs. In particular, what incompatibilists, those who think that these threats to responsibility are real, need to show is that the best understanding of the relevant values, of the value we place on our own lives and actions, uh, the value of moral blame, and the value of obligation, uh, that the best understanding of these values shows that they require and demand a kind of freedom that we wouldn't have if our actions were caused by outside factors. Again, this is, this is part of the kind of interpretive task uh, that Justice for Hedgehogs uh, brilliantly involves. Of the three kinds of significance I've mentioned, the significance of an action for the agent him or herself, the significance of an action as a basis for blame, and the significance of an action in creating or altering obligations, the first of these, personal responsibility, seems the most fundamental. Whatever the exact nature of blame, it would seem to depend in large part on the attitudes expressed in an action, and there would seem to be a close relation between the conditions that make an attitude belong to an agent in the way required to make it significant for him or her, and the conditions required to make an attitude belong to the agent in the way required to make it significant uh, for others. So I'll focus mainly on the first of my three cases, uh, the kind of significance I called personal, this is in line with the strategy of justice for hedgehogs, which is to start with ethics, with what it is to live a good life, rather than with morality, what we owe to others. According to justice for hedgehogs, there are two ethical principles about how to live which constitute a conception of human dignity. Dignity demands both that I be responsible in the, this is a quote, in the virtue sense, and that I accept judgmental and liability responsibility in appropriate circumstances. People who blame their parents or other people or society at large for their own mistakes or who cite some form of genetic determinism to absolve themselves of any responsibility for how they have acted lack dignity because dignity requires owning up to what one has done. The buck stops here as an important piece of ethical wisdom. 
The second principle also requires taking responsibility in a different, more material way. Dignity requires that I not expect others to subsidize my decisions by bearing their financial or other costs. I do not take responsibility for my own life if I demand that others absorb the cost of my choices. Living well means making choices, and that means choosing an eye, a life with an eye to the consequences of that life. In Justice for Hedgehogs, these are put forward as ethical duties, that is, as principles we must follow, and claims about what is required in order to be an agent who is responsible for his or her attitudes and actions. For my present purposes, however, I want to consider them in a slightly different light, as an account of the kind of life that a person has a reason to want to live, in which his or her actions and attitudes will have the distinctive significance of being his or hers. We can then take the account as a basis for considering what kind of freedom is required in order for an agent to have such a life. In Justice for Hedgehogs, it, it is said that responsibility in the sense we're talking about here requires merely that the agent have two capacities. Here's a quote. First, to be responsible, people must have minimal liability to, sorry, minimal ability to form true beliefs about the world, about mental states of other people, and about the likely consequences of what they do. Someone who is unable to grasp the fact that guns can harm people is not responsible when he shoots someone. Second, people must have, to a normal level, the ability to make decisions that fit what we might call the agent's normative personality, his desires, preferences, convictions, attachments, loyalties, and self-image. Genuine decisions, we think, are purposive, and someone who cannot match his final decisions to any of his desires, plans, convictions, and attachments is incapable of responsible action. Put in this way, the thesis of justice for hedgehogs, as I understand it, is this. What a person has reason to want is an authentic life, one that accords with and reflects the decisions he or she makes about how to live, and in which these decisions themselves reflect his or her desires, plans, and convictions, and are based on true beliefs about the world. The crucial thing about this conception for present purposes is that, apart perhaps from the part at the end about true beliefs, the requirements of an authentic life thus stated have to do only with the relations among an agent's mental states, his or her plans, desires, convictions, decisions, beliefs, intentions, and so on, and the actions that flow from these. As long as an agent's life has the right shape, as long as the mental events that are part of it uh, hang together in this way, those parts, those mental events and actions, belong to him in the fullest sense required in order for them to be meaningful and significant, to them to be part of the kind of life that person has reason to want to live. In particular, the significance of our decisions on this account does not require that these decisions not be caused by factors outside us. Why not? Two reasons seem to be offered so closely related that they are really just positive and negative sides of the same point. Put negatively, I, 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 get, I get to subtract from the, from the limit just handed there the amount of time taken away by my finding my place again. Put negatively, the point is that what gives decisions their significance for us, what makes them ours, is being reflective of our felt desires, plans, and convictions. That is, of our other psychological states. Put negatively, it is, that decisions that were independent of our actual present empirical psychology would be based on nothing that could give them meaning for us or make them ours in any important sense. A self detached from our actual empirical psychology would be empty and meaningless. I find these points convincing, but we should consider why they might be resisted. It can be agreed all around, I think, that whether determinism is true or not, any decision that is meaningful will have to be based on current plans, desires, and values, which at the moment of the decision are not being questioned but are held fixed, although they might be called into question and evaluated at another time. Decision and reevaluation is always piecemeal. It has to start somewhere. What an incompatibilist would see as a threat is the possibility that the processes of deciding and reevaluating these values are themselves determined by factors outside of us over which we have no control and are probably even unaware of. Why should this be a threat to the meaningfulness for us of our attitudes? It might be a threat because these outside factors could force us to reach certain conclusions, overriding our own judgment, as it were. But as Hume pointed out long ago, this is a mistake. The factors in question would determine what our, ju determine what our judgment is. They don't override it. 
A second way in which these factors might threaten the meaningfulness of our decision-making process would be if their effectiveness indicates that our overall normative judgments are influenced by factors that are normatively irrelevant. But this doesn't seem to me to follow either. The fact, if it is a fact, that our mathematical judgments are determined by factors outside us doesn't mean that they are affected by factors that are irrelevant to the mathematical correctness of the conclusions we reach, and there's no reason to think this is necessarily so in other cases. Even if this account of ethical responsibility is adequate, however, questions remain whether the conditions that justice for hedgehogs holds to be sufficient for ethical responsibility are also all that is required in order for it to be appropriate to blame agents for their actions and choices, and enough to make those choices significant in altering obligations to others. In order to answer these questions, as I said, we'd have to look into what blame is and where obligations come from, and I don't have time, uh, I don't have time to do this. But I want to close by raising one point which brings out an implication of uh, uh, the account offered in the book, uh, which seems to me quite radical, although correct, and, and I, but I'm not certain whether it goes beyond what the hedgehog intends. <laughs> According to Justice for Hedgehogs, a person is in control of her actions, as I said, in the way required for moral responsibility if, he, if she possesses the two capacities described. Dworkin remarks that this idea of control is very different from the one underlying an incompatibilist response, according to which I have to freely and independent of causal factors have chosen these attitudes. I think this may not make clear, uh, just saying that these are two different ideas of control, may not make clear how different the two conceptions are. Um, the more radical, sorry, um, how, how, to, how radically different the two conceptions are of the conditions that must be satisfied for an action to belong to an agent. I'm going to read one page. Okay. The more radical position I have in mind, which may or may not be Dworkin's, holds that the two conditions he states are conditions required in general in order for an agent to be the kind of being toward whom we can stand in the relations that make blame and obligation make sense. But they are not conditions whose fulfillment in every case makes an attitude or action attributable to an agent. Having the capacities of control that Dworkin mentions to a normal degree doesn't mean that they work in every case. And in order for attitudes to belong to an agent in the sense required for blame, they need not be ones that the agent could control through the use of these general capacities. A person can be blamed for attitudes and actions that were or would have been quite resistant to her better judgment. The fact that she had this contrary better judgment would complicate the picture of what she's like give her some credit maybe, but it, and could therefore modify the blame that is appropriate. But it doesn't change the fact that the recalcitrant attitudes really do belong to her. They're part of what she's like. More generally, conditions that are often said to modify responsibility, such as ignorance of fact, duress, and even, I would say, many forms of mental illness, do not have these effects because they make the action one that doesn't belong to the person. What they do, rather, is to affect what that action or attitude that does belong to the person indicates about him or her. And by this I mean what it indicates about her, not as a separate contra-causal self, but about her actual overall empirical psychology, about what he or she would feel and do on other occasions. An action performed in ignorance or under duress belongs to the agent in the fullest sense. Under some description, it is his or her intentional action performed for some reason. In some cases, such as hypnosis perhaps, the answer is that the action tells us very little about the person, maybe nothing. Uh, but in most cases, it'll be a matter of degree rather than difference. Willingness to perform an action that causes injury when one is under the influence of a false belief about its consequences is something different from willingness to do so with full knowledge of its effects. But both belong to the agent. I'm not certain that the position Dworkin means to hold is this more radical one, uh, but I'll find out later, I guess. Um, but if it is, it makes clear why the relations among an agent's attitude is what matters and not their causal antecedents for the purposes of responsibility. Thank you. Thank you.